I, I, I said I was keen, but I wasn't really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I know I should. I know I should. I re- yeah, I, I, I will. I will. I just, yeah, it's lazy. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. And together, we're going to explore early math pedagogies and some of the details that we missed first time around. But first, Chris, what are you reading for? Hey, what you reading for? Over the past few weeks, I have been fascinated by what it, by what it research exists on the subject of what's sometimes called like the redundancy effect in reading, and specifically what they're kind of talking about here is whether it's a good idea for someone to read aloud at the same time as pupils have eyes on text. So in other words, when pupils following, are following text, is it a good idea for a teacher to read aloud? Now, this is a practice that has a long history. And in recent years, it's something that has been criticized as people have become more cognizant of things like cognitive load theory. They've read about the redundancy effect that, and they've kind of extrapolated from that to say, well, hang on a minute, children are getting two kinds of identical information or or getting identical information in two forms. So we'd assume there's a good chance there to be a redundancy effect there. And I am, I've been reading around that, trying to find what research actually kind of backs this up. And it seems to be the case that it's actually a lot more nuanced than we might initially think. And a paper that kind of explores these nuances is called Two Types of Redundancy in Multimedia Learning, a Literature Review by Tripke et al. 2023. And basically what it says is that there are actually circumstances where someone reading aloud while someone follows can actually increase comprehension. And that this, where we really see problems with that, it's actually where pupils are asked to look at diagrams as well. So it obviously makes sense if you're trying to explain something with diagrams or with other visualizations and you want kids to be following on with the text, then they have to bounce between two kinds of visual information. Now, some of that research has been interpreted you know, wrongly in effect to say, oh, okay, we should never read aloud to kids. Um, in short, there are more nuances, nuances on this topic If you, as part of your current practice, do sometimes read aloud to pupils and have them follow the words as you do, that may not be um, a bad thing. There might be a lot of things to, uh, a lot of reasons to recommend that as a practice. As it stands, the research isn't that robust. There isn't that much of it, but it is a fascinating area to explore, for me at least. And something that definitely is relevant to a lot of schools and a lot of the pedagogy that they use relevant to reading. Anyway, what about you, Kieran? What are you reading for? So I have come across a new and interesting podcast. It has Afua Hirsch and Peter Frankopan discussing the legacy of different historical figures. I think we're only four weeks in. So there are four episodes on Napoleon. From the start to, well, they've already covered the end, but they're looking at his, his legacy in more detail. And um, I'm a bit of a Franco stan because I, I really like his interpretation of history and the way he, he looks at things. You know, Franco stan. I mean, maybe uh, that's, quality. Could... <laughs> that's quality. No, that's 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 a great pun. Um, where do I recognize the name Franco Peter Frank, Franco Pan from? He's written something you've recommended before. I'm sure of it. He wrote the Silk Roads. That's the one. Yeah. And he's been on quite a few podcasts. Um, you know, he's so he obviously he's got this uh, this sort of lens with which he tries to explore history. And uh, yeah, it's well worth checking out. 
I think listeners will enjoy it. It's because they use like a narrative, uh, but also them speaking from their position of expertise. So it's it's a really interesting format. At the start, I wasn't sure if I would like it or not, but uh, uh, three episodes in, I was convinced. And you know, on the, on the day of recording, episode four came out, so well worth checking out. Yeah, he's an engaging guy. Actually, I'm pretty sure I listened to um, a podcast which was an interview of him. I think it might have been at something like the Hay on Why Book Festival or something like that, where he was talking about his uh, back catalogue. And it was him and a couple of other historians who had written books for um, a, a kind of broader audience. And yeah, really fascinating guy. I think we've had this exact same conversation on the podcast before. <laughs> oh, good. You know, it's, it's, let's get, let's go, it's time for the podcast to go meta. Maybe people listening could write, Hashtag, I too am a Frankistan, and see if we can get his attention. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, how how disappointed would you be if you found out that you weren't the first? And that there were like thousands. <laughs> it was already a hashtag. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll find out on Saturday, won't we? <laughs> awesome. So last time we, I think, I think we went in quite a lot of detail into the early math pedagogies and research paper by Clement and Sarama. But some of the things I thought were certainly worth of more time than we gave them, or we needed to do some more reading before we came to them. So there's a section about eight or nine pages in where they discuss the research into the use of manipulatives. And so I thought we'd maybe look at some of the statements they make and, and sort of see how that matches up with what we've read, what we, uh, you know, our interpretation in the classroom and things like that there. I think they start off by just discussing the idea that using concrete manipulatives and then moving to symbolic representations or more abstract representations, this is a sequence that many teachers go through. And they say, although generally research supports this sequence, there are some critical nuances one of the dangers about commenting too much on this paper is that so much of my understanding of manipulatives of early mathematics comes from Clements and Sarama to begin with. But it certainly matches with my understanding of what I hear people talking about in schools, the idea of concrete, pictorial, abstract being the way to do things and that it's set in stone or feels set in stone. Um, yeah, that, that exists, certainly. Um, from the bits and pieces of research I've read, though it's a little while ago now, I I found that this idea, as you stated there, that it wasn't quite as simple as that and that there were circumstances under which it might not actually be the only sequence or that it has to progress in that order. The references on that statement are the EEF report into EYFS and Key Stage 1. And then a paper written previously by Clements and Sarama, which is quite a feature of the work. I mean, maybe it's just a feature of anyone's work when they've written so vastly and and in some in such detail about a subject. So, because like you say, you know, you were inspired by them. They were a lot of your sort of formative experiences engaging with this kind of research came through their work. So maybe it's just a byproduct of that. But it matches up with my thinking. The danger in the classroom is that we think we have to go through this sequence. You know, we have to do the physical or the concrete. We have to do the pictorial. We have to do the abstract. And there, there are many circumstances where that's not the case. Like if I'm thinking about mental methods, so say the if you're subtracting a single digit from a two digit number. Sometimes I'm not sure how beneficial it is to to represent that in any other way other than through conversation and dialogue. I don't know, maybe. I mean one example is subtracting ten and then making and then adding the bond to ten. You know, when you've got close proximity to ten, like nine, eight, seven. I mean, as I'm speaking, you know, you probably could represent that in some sort of cherry model, but it's not essential particularly if pupils are six, seven years old and they've got a grasp and all that stuff, then you might just be able to, you know, explore this symbolically. So, you know, even if that's not the best example in the world, I think 
there are occasions when you don't need to. And I think, you know, it's, it's something Andrew Jeffrey has been saying for a long time. We don't need to go. It's not a, it's not a, a map. It's just here are the three options we have at our disposal. And the purpose of our lesson will dictate the point, I think, and one which we choose. Yeah, this reminds me of a, a lesson that I observed where um, it was uh, the, the teacher was introducing the idea of perimeter. And one of the things they did was they got the kids out of the classroom to uh, trundle wheel, walk around the edge of the field. And then when they came back inside, they then looked at, you know, um, perimeters of rectangles, how they could be worked out, et cetera. And then eventually, once I, you know, had seen the lesson and was having a chat with the teacher about, you know, what what they what they thought went well, et cetera. They were taught, they told me about this idea. Like, well, I, I really wanted to go through the steps, you know, concrete, pictorial, abstract. And with perimeter, the, you know, if you're going to do something concrete, because we're talking about two dimensional shapes, I had to do something ideally where we took them outside or where I had actual objects in the room that were that I could that I could measure. And actually, it meant that a decent chunk of the time in the lesson wasn't used particularly well or as well as it could have been. And they had obviously seen concrete pictorial abstract as a bit of a straitjacket to the point where when we were having the conversation after the lesson, they were saying, I was struggling to work out what the abstract would be here when we're dealing with, you know, something that has, you know, it, all of the questions that a pupil might deal with or a lot of the thinking that pupils might deal with, is, with in this case is going to have a picture. It's going to have a pictorial representation. And I, I guess you could do a problem relating to perimeter where it's just written out in words, for example. But even then, you're going to be kind of picturing on some level this rectangle or whatever shape it is. And so it just that was just an example, I remember, of this tension between kind of a fairly sensible idea about concrete pictorial abstract and that generally speaking, often understanding can progress through those stages and um, sensible pedagogy, which sometimes, as I say, conflicts with that. And I think this is what turns many people off of their use entirely, you know, feeling that you have to go through this, which can feel quite laborious. So I think, yeah, it's it's like just because you're using working materials, numbers doesn't mean base 10 equipment needs to be involved. You know, it's got a very specific purpose pertaining to the magnitude and people's understanding of magnitude. I think, yeah, the, the nuance is probably a kind way of saying, let's be a bit smarter about how we, uh, we utilize these tools. So the, the next section that really stood out to me is one that I think it's, it's a question that gets asked, but not necessarily asked a lot. And it says, we therefore assume that children looking at the rods, so Cuisinart rods, I think in this instance, and doing things with them could see how the world of numbers and numerical operations worked. The trouble with that theory is that my colleague and I already knew how the numbers worked. We could say, oh, the rods behave just the way numbers do. But if we hadn't known how numbers behaved, would looking at the rods enable us to find out? Which is a really long way of saying we understand as teachers so how much of our knowledge are we placing on the manipulatives and are they actually do they actually have the capacity to support people's understanding who's neurons in particular i mean and that that does make loads of sense doesn't it the idea i mean we've all seen it in our own practice where we think we are explaining something to pupils using this using a visual representation using a manipulative and even in some cases, kids kind of getting to the right answer using these things. We think, oh, yeah, this is obviously conveying the information, this underlying structure of mathematics that I want them to get. And then afterwards, you realize that they're either just, you know, they're, they're almost using them as a calculator or you say to them, I've, I'll give you an example. I've had a situation where I've been working with base 10 and I've seen kids moving the base 10 around as they work out certain things. And then afterwards, I've gone up to them and said, OK, just to be really clear, and I hold up with a 10 rod and say, like, how many is this worth? And they can't tell me. And you just wonder how, a, I, if I hadn't gone and asked that question, I just assume, you know, they've got the right answers in their book. And often what's going on here is these are kids who already have 
you know, the underlying understanding of place value, of mental arithmetic. I think I've taught them something more to buttress this understanding through the use of these manipulatives. And actually, all they've done is almost be pretending to use them, kind of going through the motions of using them, because that's what they see their peers doing. And I think we're probably prone to that as classroom teachers a lot more than we think. You know, we we assume that we've communicated this, sim this symbolic idea beautifully. And in fact, they're often... Yeah, going through the motions in the same way as when um, you ask pupils something like, oh, OK, uh, how many is this? And they start counting again because they haven't yet learned that, you know, this like this, this idea of cardinality. And they just hear how many is that as an instruction to count them again. And so there's this connection you think is there between the language you're using and their understanding. But actually, it isn't. They're just almost responding to it, like, behavioristically. Um, I think the same thing can happen with manipulatives sometimes, where there isn't this understanding in the black box of their mind. They're just somehow going from A to B, and it looks right. I mean, what you're saying ties up with something Clemens and Saram have written about in the past, where there's this this paper, now I'm going to butcher the name. I can't remember if it's Elizabeth or not. It's E.H. Fenema. And it's a paper from 1972, and it's a really well constructed, in my opinion, paper. And it suggests that Cuisinier rods are less effective in some instances than symbolic instruction. And the thing that gets overlooked sometimes about this research is that it was the prior knowledge and the experiential background of the pupils that made that possible. And I think where pupils do understand the mathematics, there is a case for manipulatives not being necessary, you know, and it depends on how, how robust their schema are and how flexible they are with the with the information that they have. But yeah, but there's there's definitely other 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 papers and other pieces of research that would suggest that if when, when pupils know things, you know, then they're not necessarily going to be served by manipulatives. And I think, you know, with reference to adults ascribing, you know, the, the, the creation of meaning because they can see it, I, I think it's a, it's a definite, definite possibility. Be, you know, things like the bar model, when, when the bar model gets out of control and we've got really, I know it's not necessarily a physical manipulative, but it is something you manipulate when you look at mathematical problems. When when it's when you, when you've got all these weird and wonderful versions, how much help is it really going to be to a pupil? You know, how you know is it going to be more helpful than underlining the important words and that kind of thing? You know, I think, yeah. So I I, I can see this. I think we do apply this, and I think it's borne out in some other research, particularly if we if you think about those people who already know. And, it, you know, it almost feeds into their first principle. Now, I'm going to go through their principles in a bit, but the first two sort of ideas are tied together by the idea that we need a model with the manipulatives. You know, the, these, you know, these representations we create, they have a purpose, and we need to be very clear in our minds what it is we're trying to exemplify. You know, because something like Cuisinera rods, we always talk about how much time you need to spend getting to, you know, playing with them, understanding the the relationship between the different rods, and then you can use them to generalize. And so I think it's definitely, yeah, we need to be clear in our mind exactly what the purpose of I, I mean, it sounds like this is going to be the, the summary of every single thing. We need to be clear. But, you know, I think, I think it's rule number one. Why are we using them? Because otherwise, who knows what the outcome will be. What I love is sometimes you get teachers who, well, there was a teacher I remember kind of taught me a lesson about the purpose of the manipulatives. I went into their classroom and I was hoping, they were I knew they were teaching place value. I was aware of their... Um, of like where they were up into this in the sequence and they were talking about um, deans, etc., and I was hoping to go and see them actually modeling with the deans, using them, et cetera, getting the 
children to learn using them and they opened up to me and said we don't actually have enough so the class next door are using them right now I was like oh well, okay and I noticed across the room that the kids were all using this notation which was kind of sticks and dots and I thought oh well this is a really poor you know replacement for that and then I went around the room to all the kids and they said oh yeah no this stick that's just because we don't have the the tens right now so this means a 10 and these dots mean ones so look let me show you line 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 dot 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 that's 34 because i've got three tens and four ones and i thought oh okay <laughs> okay this is a teacher who is understands what's going on here so even though they didn't have the equipment at that moment the teacher was totally fine with it because they were using a symbolic representation to show their understanding of tens and ones and it didn't matter that it was the physical manipulative that they'd been using in the past and what was lovely about it as well is that the teacher you know, you saw, I saw in the conversations they're having, they were saying to the kids like, oh yeah, I see you can recognize that's 34. But I wonder if you can now try that, you know, that same thing where we're adding, you know, 30 to 34. Try it without the, um, try it without the, the picture you've got this time. Just see if you can add those three tens to 34. What do you think it'll be? And then you see the kids cogs whirring. They go, oh, well, it's 64. And then the teacher says, well, do you think you needed to draw it? And the kid's like, I could draw it, but... Nah, and and it's it's lovely because there's something about a teacher who just inherently gets this idea that representations and manipulatives are a way to get to the mathematics rather than this that they're that they're a tool rather than just something to use. Um, and dare I say that was not a hugely experienced teacher. It was just someone who kind of got manipulatives and what they were for what visual representations were for um so yeah it's always nice to share a story about a teacher who really gets it it actually speaks to something that doesn't get mentioned in this paper but the clemson and trauma have mentioned before and i sort of did some digging on it it's uh the idea that the more salient a resource the more difficult transfer might be mm -hmm. and so uh, what's the paper they talk about? Um, I've got it. It's called Dual Representation and the Linking of Concrete and Symbolic Representations. Now, I really hope that's the real paper. Certainly in my notes, that's the one that I have attributed this study to. But I'm sure you've heard me bang on about it before. They took a toy Snoopy and put it in a doll's house in a room. And they put a teddy bear Snoopy in the same room in a real house. And basically, the children who were asked to find the Teddy Snoopy and they couldn't. And their conclusion was that the representation had been too salient. You know, it was too real. That they oh, couldn't so, quite... so, and, and by what, when you say too salient, I'm, now, I'm probably going to be misconstruing uh, what's going on here. But in effect, if perhaps, you know, they put a Snoopy in a toy house, if perhaps it had been not a snoopy or if it had been a picture of the house or how could how could it have been less salient in order to be more effective in this case just so i wrap my head around it good point i mean like, yeah I'm, I'm thinking of a picture and you know a two-dimensional version of a house you know you know those doll's houses that move have the front come off mm. um and then maybe like a little circle you know they would have been able to find it if you put an x there because children are all pirates and they would have known exactly where to go to find the treasure and yeah, so may, yeah, maybe, I mean, in the classroom, it's easier to describe this because it's, you know, when do we use cupcakes and when do we just use counters to represent cupcakes? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's a good question. That's by Doherty, Newland, Hand and Deloach. Maybe they're going to get an email from us to see what. Uh, <laughs> what well, I guess, I guess the idea of the salience in this case is, you know, you put Snoopy in a doll's house and then you say, oh, can you use this to find, you know, Snoopy in your classroom? You're like, well, no, he's already here in the doll's house because it isn't this little Snoopy isn't just isn't representing a Snoopy. It is Snoopy. You know, <laughs> I know it sounds, but I assume that's the kind of the, the point that they're making, that it's harder to make that symbolic reference when the thing you're using a symbol is so close to the the real thing itself. Whereas if you distance yourself from it, you make it a counter or you make it a, an X marks the spot or whatever it might be. It's more apparent that this is standing for something rather than this being the thing itself. I, I hope that's, 
the point. If it, if it isn't, then I haven't understood at all. <laughs> no, I mean, that certainly sounds like that's the point. And I think it's a really good way of describing it. Yeah, because yeah, kids going to be all, all, there he is. <laughs> Job done, research over. <laughs> you guys can go home early now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I say, I really hope that's the right paper because it's been a long time since I prepped for that talk, you know, my guiding principles about research. But yeah, but because lots of year two teachers in particular will say they can do it with the manipulatives or they can do it with, you know, the resources, but they can't do it in their books, which is shorthand for, you know, they, they can't transfer this to sort of symbolic notation. And it might be that whatever's happening is too concrete and that might speak to the idea that they're being used as calculators as well you know because you're literally got that one-to-one -one correspondence with everything and you're going to you're going to struggle and speaking to the point you made before as well when i've taught with manipulatives in the past and when i was quite new to manipulatives and like really a big fan of them i had circumstances where i had the reverse where in effect we were doing say you know two digit add two digits addition mentally and I've got a kid in the room who can just do it. And it's like, well, I, you know, 37 adds 64 is 101. It's like, oh, okay. But can you show me with the manipulatives? And they just couldn't because they're like, well, why? I, I, I know the answer. And yeah, so you sometimes can end up trying to force the reverse as if to say, look, I'm really keen on manipulatives. So play, you know, play the game with me on this one, kid. And yeah, I, you know, obviously regret that. And so you should, you know, because, yeah, being able to show, I don't know, I'm not really sure what that demonstrates. Really, you're, you're asking them to demonstrate their reasoning, but there's a time and a place and it's not all the time and every place. Yeah. You know, and even then, I suspect these kids could have spoken through their reasoning. They could have said, oh, well, 60 and 30 is 90, 7 and 4 is 11. And then, you know. 90 and 10 and 1 is 101 you know i'm always terrified by the way when i do mental arithmetic like off off the top of my head on the podcast because you just have to have one slip and you make yourself sound like a fool so do do check me back on this one and then delete it if i've made a fool of myself or turn up the volume knowing you <laughs> yeah, on repeat <laughs> make it the cold drop at the start yeah. of the episode lovely Actually, I always do check the mental maths and sometimes I've cut out lengthy pauses while people have worked out things. So if anyone's keen to go back and find examples of those, we'll give a free copy of the art and science of teaching primary reading to anyone who finds an example of mental maths in a previous episode. And that goes across all guests, not just Chris. <laughs> all guests, I need to get myself some more copies. I mean, the last thing for me that I've got on this is that uh, the whole salience idea brings in our understanding or our deployment of what's known as pre-structured resources and essentially Dinesh equipment or base 10 equipment is an example of a pre-structured resource. Numicon will be pre-structured as well because it has a, it has it, its physical existence makes it what it is. So for instance, when we're exchanging one ten for 10 ones at some point, there's a sleight of hand where you go, all right, kids, ignore this 10. Here are 10 ones instead. Whereas if you use virtual manipulatives, like on MathSpot, you just lasso one 10, press the exchange button, and you get 10 ones. And so there's actually, you know, even though it's really concrete, it's slightly less mathematically accurate, I think. Same with geoboards, perhaps because you're never truly representing, even though it is more physical. You know, I don't know if geoboards count as pre-structured resources, but if you make a circle digitally, all the points will be equidistant from the midpoint. And so, yeah, so it's worth thinking, you know, my take from the whole salience, does it help people understand the mathematics, is the idea that virtual manipulatives have a purpose have the backing of quite a few research papers in this area and so yeah i think that that that's where i got to and i think it's where clemens and sarama got to too but i was reading the research in their references on one of their papers so you know well done me for getting to the same place that they got to yeah it's interesting because often we think of manipulatives and saying well the, the thing is you have to be able to 
touch them you know you have to physically interact with them and i, de I definitely think there's value particularly if we're talking about early mathematics of pupils interacting with all sorts of objects in a meaningful way in order to develop an understanding of number but when it comes down to you know teaching unfamiliar mathematical concepts that manipulate is more about being able to do stuff with rather than you know physically handle in a lot of cases and as you say digital manipulatives offer so much more flexibility in certain circumstances if it's not just you know the speed with which you can say decompose a 10 into 10 ones i mean i know you can stick together 10 ones using blue tack i've done it and do a visualizer to say look here's a 10 here's one i made early and like you say doing the sleight of hand but with digital stuff being able to you know draw around it you know that's 13 it looked like 13 ones but watch it automatically assemble into a 10 and a three is um uh, yeah not something you can do quite so easily with the physical version so yeah big fan of um maths bot um what's the american one is it um i want to say maths resources math no maths learning center that's a really good american so that combining that with maths bot and looking at the strengths and weaknesses of both is um yeah, my, my, the two that I relied on more than any. I mean, actually, this feeds right into possibly the standout quote from the paper. Under, I mean, I, actually, I think it's a quote that they've made too, but it's, it's the standout in both papers, if they're true. Understanding does not travel through the fingertips and up the arm. You know, so you're talking there about the idea that, uh, you know, it's not necessarily about touching things. That's they, they literally go on to say that uh, teachers need to reflect on their students' representations and help them develop increasingly sophisticated and mathematical representations. I mean, the example that I like to give people is a five frame with two yellow counters and one red counter, and then ask them what's represented by this representation. And every group I give this to totally different set of answers. I mean, there's some stock answers. You know, you've got the addition of fractions. You've got subitizing. You've got composition of number with with sort of small numbers. But I, I've seen some weird, wonderful ways of interpreting that representation. And it just goes to show that, you know, the mean, you know my, my point that I always make is that meaning is constructed with, not by the manipulatives. And I think that's essentially what they're driving at is the idea that, you know, you could have the the perfect, I don't know, explanation of completing the square using algebra tiles, but that doesn't guarantee that people are going to understand it. You know, maybe that's a bad example. This goes to show that we need to be really purposeful about what we do. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yes, yeah, it does indeed. <laughs> How is this possible? It's not even planned. <laughs> Sorry indulge my um, desire to say there needs to be a purpose <laughs> that's basically the, the central theme for all of you Kofi, Kofi, Kofufu however you pronounce it you damn lovely supporters it's a song going out to you to you Stephanie Taylor, Mrs. B. S. Atea, Adam, Katie, Liv, Dempsey, Becca, Jenford, Susie, Brown, and CEO, Ned, Chio, Rachel, I am Al, Jessica, Tom, Oakley, Tom, Brassington, Jessica, Tom, Oakley, Tom, Brassington, LJ, and last but not least, my lovely little Amy Bill, so they help us pay the bills, so. Massive thank you out to Dabby family. Coffee supporters help us keeping it at free. There's far more content coming just round the bend. Thank you all for helping our very special friends. Friends. Very special friends. Before we get to their principles, 
and sort of draw a line underneath the exploration of manipulatives in this paper. They mention sensory concrete knowledge and integrated concrete knowledge. And I think it's something I've explored in the past and something that, again, feeds the idea that virtual manipulatives are just as valuable as concrete manipulatives because of the interpretation of the word concrete. You know, we think of concrete, we think of, you know, the stuff that goes in the floor. We think of things you can touch, things you can feel, but that's your sensory concrete knowledge. And so having these two two definitions really, really helps because integrated concrete knowledge, I think it's just another way of describing schema and, and schema theory. The idea that what's concrete to a pupil is the knowledge they already have. You know, like Dan Willingham talks about the idea that, you know, what's concrete to pupils is the, is the stuff they already know. And we, we start from what they know and we build, you know, and all, pretty much that's how to build as well, isn't it? The, the most important thing is what a, is what a pupil already knows, you know, to really badly paraphrase. And so this integrated concrete knowledge is the idea that what you know is really concrete. You can, you feel like you can touch it. So when we think about concrete, we should probably think about the original etymology, which is growing together because your knowledge can grow and join together. As you said, there are um, five principles that are noted in this paper about how to use manipulatives. I'm quite interested in how they align with your principles for using manipulatives that you talked about in um, research ed conferences. So I wonder if you could outline the five principles and how they do relate to yours. Yeah, I was very interested. When I saw that they had principles, I was like, oh, I wonder if they match up. I've only got three principles. Theirs are very good. First one is model with manipulatives. And I won't go into the post amble that comes with it because they explain what they mean by this. But it's well worth reading. Encourage appropriate play with manipulatives. Ensure manipulatives serve as symbols, which I think we touched on last time. Use drawings and symbols, moving away from manipulatives as soon as possible. And use digital manipulatives too. So those are the five recommendations based on the research they've read. Mine were... The more salient a resource, the less likely transfer becomes. So make generalizations a priority in task design and utilize virtual manipulatives. Meaning is constructed with, not by, the manipulatives. Use fewer carefully chosen manipulatives. And then the one I mentioned earlier on, experiential background determines success of chosen models. So map out the sequence to ensure all pupils have the rich experiences needed to succeed it feels like they're roughly in the same ballpark oh definitely yeah i mean i think you've just consolidated you know a couple of them um into i guess the one that's slightly missing or that isn't kind of explicitly touched upon is the idea of appropriate play so there and i think we talked about that in the last podcast when we talked about the first half of this i think we briefly mentioned this idea of what like, what equates to appropriate play because I think the idea was that um, it's really useful sometimes to give pupils a chance to just experience the manipulative, just to kind of get used to it. But if you kind of overdo that, it can become a case where they no longer are ready to see it symbolically, to see it as representing something else. It's just now a toy rather than something that represents an idea that you're trying to get at. Um, I think that's kind of implicit in what you said, but they make it they make it explicit. Yeah, I think that that sequence, which ensures all pupils have the experiences needed, at a certain point in the trajectory, that's probably going to be in there. But yeah, you're right. I don't, uh, I don't explicitly say that because really, I'm thinking about those pupils who don't get to play with number and stuff like that there, and and who can't use, I don't know, flexible strategies to think through mathematical problems and rely on sort of rudimentary counting strategies. Of, you know, well into their teenage years. Yeah. And, and, and dare I say, it feels like a, a bit in the, in the context of UK education, it feels like a bit of a niche concern. I don't imagine there are too many schools around the country who are saying, oh, goodness, we let our year threes play with the, the deans or Dinesh uh, blocks for 
you know, a couple of weeks and now we're trying to use them and they just won't see them as representing, you know, base 10 in some form. Um, don't think that's particularly common. It's probably not something that we need to worry about hugely in the, in the UK or at least in English schools context. I mean, trust us to spend the bulk of the episode talking about the thing that interests us the most or certainly interests me the most. But we did say we'd round everything off in this episode. Practice is up next. What stood out to you, Chris, with regards to practice in the early mathematics classroom? Uh, a couple of claims. Uh, the first of which is the idea, the importance of um, getting a, a particular success rate. And they suggest that aiming for around 70% seems to be particularly um effective particularly is but is the ideal presumably because it's a high enough success rate for pupils to be understanding what they're doing to be um building confidence but it isn't so high that there is that, that there's evidence that there is a lack of challenge there for me 70 percent feels a little low and I, again i probably need to dive into the research a little further to see where they're getting this from but if, for example, I gave pupils, you know, 10 questions to practice and they got seven out of 10, that for me, that would be borderline at the point where I thought, actually, I might need to teach. There are, there are probably components of this that I need to teach again. Or, I mean, it obviously, it depends if there are patterns across the classroom, other aspects of formative assessment that I might put in place. But 70% does instinctively feel a little low to me. So that's kind of the first thing that stood out to me. They talk about the importance of um, short, frequent practice in various contexts that builds on conceptual foundations that are already really solid. And again, I maybe quibble this a little bit, not because I don't think that practice should be connected to conceptual understanding. I mean, that's you know largely the point. You want people to be able to do things and you want them to be able to understand things. And like these are often two things that they're two sides of the same coin quite often. Um, and my point here is that this idea that you have to definitely have a really strong conceptual understanding before you start practicing something. It reminds me of certain, I think, misconceptions that I had when I was teaching certain procedures around mathematics, particularly things like you know, you're teaching pupils a written method of addition and you want them to, or let's say a written method of subtraction. And you say, you know what? I want them to understand exactly why this works before I get them to do lots of practice. And maybe that's one way of doing things. But in certain circumstances, actually getting pupils fluent with that as, as a procedure that feels almost something somewhat detached from that underlying understanding until they can just do it make can sometimes make it a little easier to to then explore the conceptual understanding behind it. it's like yeah you can all add two digit well it's unlikely i'm going to be asking kids to add two digit numbers with a written method but you can all add four digit numbers with written methods now let's see how that ties into our understanding of base 10 why does this work now this isn't to say that that's the only order to teach that in but I think saying that you always have to have this bedrock of conceptual understanding fully in place before you start practicing, say, a procedure. Yeah, I, I, I think I don't. I think and perhaps in practice that's not how it always works or how it should always play out. What about you? Do you? Because we've talked in the past with I think when Gareth Metcalf's on the pod about this idea of like the the what might be the best order or when is it the right time for there to be this you know, mixture of conceptual understanding and just, you know, churning through the process. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think back to what I said in case I contradict myself, but I can definitely see a purpose. I mean, when a curriculum is really well sequenced, you can leverage those kind of opportunities. I think I mentioned a while ago that Oscar was learning about the multiplication of two two-digit numbers. A couple of weeks later, he was learning about area. And so really what you've got there is a procedure that can help you explore, you know, not that I've ever encountered a year four class where the area was like 22 for the width and 48 for the, the length, that kind of thing. But 
there's an opportunity to do so if you really wanted to, if you could, if people can multiply two digit numbers. So I, th I think there, there are definitely opportunities within the curriculum to sequence them in such a way that, you know, it, you, you do a bit of legwork, you get reasonably confident and comfortable with the procedure, and then you can really get the most from it. Because, you know, I always say, you can, you, well, I don't always say, other people always say, and I, and I agree with them, you know, you can only think with what you know, you know, and I think this feeds into this. Yeah. Uh, long way of saying, yeah, I think, I, I think, yeah, you're right. I think, yeah, because the research in, in this area is a bit more shallow, which I think is probably one of the reasons why we're giving it less air time than some of the other aspects you know there's lots of research into the use of manipulatives but the the nuances of practice you know you'll see a lot in the sort of relative to us eastern research you know I, i'm pretty sure it might was a goo who had a treatise on the importance of over practice but it, it wasn't described in such a way but it was, it was essentially you know do not misinterpret the sort of the prevalence of practice in chinese classrooms as a, a way towards a superficial understanding. It was very much a case of this is essential for our pupils and the way we make our pupils practice can draw out really, really fundamental properties at the same time. So yes, I, 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 yeah, I, th I think I'm with you on that. You know, I certainly don't avoid doing so. And I think there are definitely times, like I mentioned the, the addition or the subtraction of, a, of one digit from two digits. If you're doing that subtract 10 and add in the bond, well, if you don't know your number bonds, that middle step is very difficult. Well, what am I going to add? Or that second step, well, what am I going to add? Because essentially you are um, identifying that you will need to do some gymnastics. You subtract 10, which should be reasonably straightforward for most kids. But then, well, what's the bond to 10? And so then that can be a sticking point. So I, I, I see where you're coming from. Or within that section as well, the other thing that stood out to me is they mention, um, I would say, perhaps somewhat disparagingly, they talk about the you know science of maths advocates. And as someone who's kind of become vaguely associated with the what's known in America and Canada as the, the science of reading movement, um, I'm interested in that. And often the teachers who are interested in science of reading will, you know, Unintent will like tag me into stuff that relates to the science of maths, and, and I am in, I'm interested in it. And what Clements, Lizcano, and Sarama suggest here is that people who are kind of advocates of the science of maths are those often that um, recommend drills without any caveats about how and when they should be used. And maybe that's the case, but it doesn't align with my experiences on Twitter. At least I've seen lots of people who would say that they're interested in the idea of, sci of, sci of a science of maths and what that might represent, who are actually pretty nuanced in their views around practice. Which kind of brings us on to the next section, which talks about affect, motivation, and engagement. And there's, there's lots of stuff in there we could, we could dig into. I don't think the research in there is um, quite as interesting to us because it's more... Uh, a lot of it is more general rather than very specific to maths. But one of the things that the authors say, even instruction that increases memorization, for example, via drill in the short run, may damage motivation. I mean, they don't define in this paper at any point, as far as I can tell, what they mean by drill. And obviously, under certain circumstances, getting kids just to go through lots of calculations, whatever you might define as too many calculations, yeah, of course, is going to damage motivation. But I would make the argument that things like times table rock stars, numbots, using flashcards to learn, um, multiplication and addition facts are things that are might be commonly associated with the idea of drill. And at the same time, are some in, in, used well as some of the most motivating tools that I've seen used relating to aspects of, you know, foundational aspects of mathematics. So I'm a little wary of some of the way that they use the words drill and practice 
and some of the ways that they're slightly, perhaps unintentionally, and maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but slightly disparagingly towards um, why, what might be thought of as just, you know, shed loads of practice, which is often a really good thing. We've almost come full circle. So we started, I think, with a straw man and we're finishing with this potential straw man. You know, you know, I, I think it goes without saying that we have a tremendous amount of respect for the authors of this paper. We probably wouldn't be where we are today without their influence. But I always think a healthy amount of skepticism and, you know, probing is, you know, I mean, it's our raison d'etre, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um, to push the boundaries. It's fair to note that, you know, like Clements and Sarama, I don't know as much about the work of René Lascano, but Douglas Clements and Julie Sarama have forgotten more about maths education than I'll ever know. So, yeah, like anything that I that I say that questions some of their ideas has to be taken with, you know, that caveat in mind, taken with a pinch of salt for certain. Um, yeah, anyone who hasn't already read um, their work relating to learning trajectories that haven't explored the learning trajectories website really must. It's absolutely incredible. It's worth noting, I think, before we wrap up, that there are other... Um, aspects to this paper that we perhaps don't have time to explore in depth. They talk about the value of working with parents, how that should be like a two-way street, how, you know, maths games can play a role. There's a really fascinating section on uh, culturally relevant pedagogy, I should say, which you really want to dive into that in some depth. The kind of key takeaway from that as is the case when talking about culturally relevant pedagogy with regards to reading or any other area, is that acknowledging, celebrating, making visible diverse backgrounds, cultures and ethnicities is, it's not just like, it's an obvious thing that's important, but it's it's fundamental to what you're doing in the classroom, um, whether you work, you know, in England, America, wherever that might be. Um, and there's a, for those who are new to the idea of um, a funds of knowledge um, interpretation of some of this stuff, this paper might be a quite nice little introduction to that in a con contextualized fashion. So perhaps if everything else we've said in the in this podcast isn't um, something that makes you want to go read the paper, then think, uh, looking into what they say about culturally relevant pedagogy might be something that drags you in. And uh, a good thing too, that would be. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if anyone's listening and thinking, oh, yeah, I would I'd actually quite like to read this paper, I shared a copy of it on the Hey, What You Reading For newsletter. I think you can subscribe to that via the website, thinkingdeeply.info, but I'll also retweet underneath this in case anyone wants to have a go. I'm, I'm a bit. Sad that we didn't get into the board game stuff because I spent quite a lot of time on this. Maybe it would be good if our Christmas episode was about board games. I mean, that would be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, you know what? I'm perhaps just in a, 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 like a broader topic of how parents can support children at home with regards to their mathematical development because obviously board games, big part of that. Um, yeah, or we could just, you know, live stream us playing Settlers of Catan or something like that. Oh yeah, I've got Catan Junior. I might beat you at that, but I don't know if I've got the stamina for the full game. But yeah, no, I recently got a copy of my book for that we used to give to families, and we give to all the curers in Kent as well. I had saved it for some reason in publisher, and couldn't open it. So by then, I'll have that back, and I'll, I'll share that for free with everybody because people ask me about it after I do talks, and I always. I'll say I'll, I'll try and get this open and publisher and try and get it reformatted and stuff. But to this date, I have not managed it, but I've now got a Word document version. And it's my little book of games for families. And um, because I always go with the mantra that I don't really want parents reteaching maths at home. I'd much rather they were engaging socially with them in a mathematical context, you know, because, yeah, it, it can be stress. Homework can be stressful, you know, as a father of two kids. I've had many a Sunday ruined by trying to <laughs> get the homework done. So yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll pencil in. I think Christmas is a Monday, so it'll be the Saturday before Christmas. We'll we'll try and get that episode done for. One final thing, 
do we want listeners to use the hashtag hashtag I stan Franco plan or hashtag I too am a Franco stan? It's got to be the second. Oh, actually, no. How? Let's keep it simple. Just hashtag Franco stan. Hashtag Franco stan. Yeah, I can't imagine that that's going to get confused with anything else. Um, yeah, I mean, is Stanley currently learning French? Probably not. I can't see any. <laughs> well, well, that's the thing. You come up with hashtag Franco Stan and then you find out that Stanley is in a large community of French Canadians sharing their joy of the language or something. But fingers crossed. I mean, worst case scenario is that it turns out to be a disputed territory that's not on the UN list of nations. And we're <laughs> really getting our foot into something here. Yeah, love that. Love. Yeah, no, it turns out to be a little area east of, in East Slovakia with its own distinct culture and language. And we've offended at least 40 people. Nice. Well, let's find out. Retweet the episode with hashtag Frankistan. I can't wait. There's not going to be any Frankistans. It's like if at least one person knew. does it. <laughs> if one person does it, it'll be all well worthwhile. All I said to do is say thank you very much for joining me, Chris. Always a pleasure. And to everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening.